wow. I, I have not seen the, the chapel this full in a long time. This is great. In fact, hang on just a sec. I mean, it's, it's a testament to our author tonight, but excuse me just a sec. I want my boss to see this just a sec. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, this, this is great. This has been, I'm, for those who don't know, I, I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library, and I'm obviously glad that you all are here. Um, you know, this is, this is a really special week for us. I mean, Mrs. Carter turns 96 years old tomorrow. <laughs> If you haven't been to our museum, um, our admission tomorrow is 96 cents. So I think you all can afford it. Uh, we're gonna have birthday cake. It's, it's really good. We've got a new exhibit about Andrew Young and, and all of the things that uh, he has done, the many lives of Andrew Young. It's really good, worth, worth seeing. And you know, the other thing, it's really special for us and our partner, Acapella Books, because night before last, we hosted James McBride for his book, Heaven and Earth Grocery Store. That happens to be number three on the New York Times bestseller list, okay? Tonight, Ann Padgett is here with her book, Tom Lake, which happens to be number two on the <laughs> New York Times bestseller list. I mean, we love having great authors come in. One of the things I encourage you to do out in the, uh, the lobby um, on one of the blue skirted tables, there are these sheets with authors that we have coming. And I want you to pick those up because I think you're going to want to come back and, and see us. We always encourage people to, to come back time and time again. You know, one of the things I really like about our program is that not only do we bring you some of the best names and biggest names in, uh, in literature, but we also introduce you to new authors or books that you may not know about, um, but we think are worth your time. Um, I mean, wouldn't you all have loved to have been in Ann Padgett's first author program? Or also or James McBride either to see them at their first and know this author is going places and you were there when it started. Well, that's also what we're doing tonight. Lindsay Lynch has her first novel, Do Tell, which the New York Times describes as a rich portrait of the lives of early Hollywood's beautiful puppets and those pulling their strings. Other reviewers have called it sparkling, sharp, stunning, intelligent. You get my drift. They really liked it. <laughs> Including one reviewer who wrote, I stepped into the stream of the narrative and didn't look up until I came to the last page. And we are fortunate tonight to have that reviewer with us, Ann Padgett. <laughs> Tom Lake is her ninth novel. Along the way, she's published four nonfiction books and a couple of children's books. She has received so many awards for her work, including the National Humanities Medal, the Penn Faulkner Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship. Her, uh, her book, The Dutch House, was a finalist for the Pulitzer, and her books have been translated into more than 30 languages. There is so much more that I could say about Ann Padgett, but I got us started late and you'd rather hear from her than me. So please join me in welcoming Lindsay Lynch and Ann Padgett.
Nashville. We both live in Nashville. And every time I would be getting ready to go on book tour, I would always say, I want to do an event in Atlanta. And oh, wait. Hey. <laughs> am I not supposed to just... <laughs> Am I not supposed to just sit on the microphone? <laughs> Who here has done an event before? <laughs> and now I'm thinking, this is probably why they never invited me. <laughs> I learned from the best. <laughs> she hasn't gotten the whole microphone thing down. Anyway, I'm thrilled to be here, and I am especially thrilled to be here with you. I'm thrilled to be here with you, too. Um, so let me just tell you how we know each other. We work together. Um, I own Parnassus Books in Nashville. And, and, and Lindsay works at Parnassus Books in Nashville. And we have known each other a really long time at this point. Yeah, since I, it was one of my first jobs out of college, 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been there on and off since then. So. You came to town, and then you left. I came to town, you looked me in the eye, and you said, Lindsay Lynch, you're gonna be an author. That's um, right. The rest That's is history. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Lindsay and I were on the Today Show together a couple of weeks ago, and that was, we've never we haven't talked about this, but that was such a funny moment. So, and Jenna Bush said, so when she walked in the door, what did you think? And I said, I thought that she would grow up and be a famous author. And, and Jenna said, really, did you? And I was like, just go with it. Just, just. I just had that sparkle in my eye. I know, I know. I mean, your, your application, it was flawlessly written. The application, I said, I'm definitely not applying to a job at Parnassus Books as a long tenure con to get a book published. That's right. That's Talk about playing the long game. Mm -hmm. That was a very good idea. So, Lindsay, well, we hired you for what when you first came? I was originally hired as part-time seasonal help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which means she has great gift wrap skills. Yeah. Um, and I had like three other jobs at this point because that's millennial life for you. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, I was a full-time bookseller. I have also been the sideline buyer. I have been the social media manager. I have been like web orders help for a while, and then at other bookstores, I've been a subscription manager and a programs coordinator, and now I'm the adult book buyer for Parnassus. Absolutely. So Lindsay went away, she went to graduate school, she went back to DC, did a stint at Politics and Prose, and then our buy, hey, Politics and Prose people, um, our buyer at Parnassus left, and I said to the manager, let's reach out to our three favorite employees who have left us and moved away and see if any of them wanted to come back. And one said no, and one said maybe, and one said yes. It was like a very three bears situation. It's like the fastest yes of my life. <laughs> I think I took 20 minutes after that phone call to consider it. <laughs> so at, when you came back to Parnassus, at what point was do tell? By the time I came back okay. to Parnassus... You know, first it was the microphone. <laughs> okay, all right. Do you, do you want to know no, I'm, over? No, I'm done, thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if once, I put, once I open the water bottle, it's going to be a full-on disaster. Um, yeah, by the time I came back to Parnassus Part 2, the novel had gone through a major rewrite over the course of 2020, which... Um, not the best time to rewrite an entire novel, but though maybe it was because my narrator became like my imaginary friend during the pandemic, at least in the thick of it. Um, and I had at that point, I think, gotten rejected by I don't even know how many literary agents, which prompted the rewriting of the book. So I was just towards the end of revising that rewrite and crossing my fingers and bracing myself before sending it back out again. Yeah. It Having this relationship and seeing Lindsay every day through the revisions and rejections and acceptance, it's very nostalgic. Um, you know, my book has a lot to do with mothers and daughters, and I don't have children, um, but I always think of you as like my novelist daughter. Uh, you know? <laughs> I can't wait for how many Instagram comments we're going to get. Is Lindsay Lynch Ann's daughter? No. 
Kathy Lynch is my mother. Okay, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not encroaching on Kathy's territory whatsoever. But She's not here, we won't tell her. Okay, but it's, <laughs> it's just incredible to watch another person go through this because when you've published as many books as I have, you, you aren't up close with that process and it's, um, it's sad and demoralizing and so hard and that's what I remember because that's, it was all of those things for me as well. Uh, and to, to watch you go through it was a little bit of reliving it for me. Yeah, and I was just writing about this in the Q&A because rewriting the book during the pandemic was such an isolating experience and just being in like, not just rewriting the book, but being in the thick of, I have been rejected so many times and rewriting this book, I don't know if it's gonna amount to anything. But the fact that on the other side of it, so many of the major milestones and celebrations have happened while I have literally been in the bookstore. Like I got the call that the book sold at auction, I think 20 minutes before we were set to do a like virtual Zoom book recommendation. So I was literally in the store. <laughs> so there, it's just wonderful to go, I mean, the isolation is terrible, but to have the, this sense of community at Parnassus on the other side and to be able to celebrate all of these things with people who really, really care about books and understand what it means. It's just been incredible. Well, I really, really care about books and also really, really care about you. Um, and I'll, t I'll tell you, if there's anybody here who's interested in being a writer or whoever wrote or knows somebody who wants to be a writer, which I imagine that probably covers just about everybody here in one degree or another, what you need to be a writer is what Lindsay has. And also what I have, although I feel like you have even more of it, which is the ability to face rejection and get up and do it again. Because, oh my gosh, there are not many people built for that at all. And when we were back signing books before this event, and Cynthia, who doesn't work at acapella, but is married to acapella, and she was saying, oh, so many people just keep saying, I'm gonna write a book, I wanna write a book, I'm gonna write a book, and they can't write a book. And I think, you know, the thing, there are certain things that I feel like people can't do, very few people can do. I always think people are mm, smarter than I am and they're probably more talented than I am, but I have two great skills that you have, the ability to be alone and to stay focused without any reward, and <laughs> the ability to meet with rejection, or later on, cruelty. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> this is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and be able to take it and not, and not get crushed. I mean, people who have sort of uh, artistic souls are often the people who are the most easily crushed. Yeah, and it's, it's a very specific type of perseverance you have to have because it's not just trying the same thing over and over again. There also has to be a very receptiveness to both getting feedback as you're getting rejected, <laughs> having those difficult conversations with yourself about, you know, what am I willing to change about this and still have it be the book that I want to write. Like those conversations are really hard to navigate, so it's not just like, I wrote this book and I'm going to send it out to as many people as possible. It's okay, this is the point where something has to change and I have to be, I have to listen to these outside voices, listen to the world. And, and still hold on to your inside voice mm -hmm. and know what's right. See, now that's something that I feel like I got out of graduate school and I feel like I got almost nothing out of graduate school. <laughs> um, yeah, MFAs. But did you feel that? Did you, did you feel like that was something that you got? because everybody's piling on opinions. Yeah, I, I think I figured out pretty early on that you just pick two people in the workshop to listen to and everything else is just kind of noise. <laughs> That's really smart. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Because it, people will give you incredibly bad advice, <laughs> sometimes purposefully incredibly <laughs> bad advice. There also is a direct correlation between in a workshop, the worse something is, the more people will feel flummoxed and say, 
oh, I love the way you use the color blue in that sentence. That was masterful. Because they can't say, you know what? There's really still time for you to go into dental hygiene. <laughs> uh, and don't worry about it. So they praise really over the top the very worst things. And the things that are actually really good, they think one, that person can take it, but two, it can be jealous, and so they'll, they'll try to really rip it apart. And just getting to calculate all of that in your brain is a real skill. Yeah, I think those like flummox workshops are when you get comments like, this is a really good name. <laughs> like that's what we're talking about in workshop, it's like the names because nobody wants to touch like yeah. the big thing that's wrong. <laughs> the toxicness of the piece itself. Um, so, Lindsay and I are doing four events uh, on book tour together. This is our first one, so you know we're just kind of figuring out what our show is. But we <laughs> talked a lot about the things that we wanted to talk about while we were doing this, what we talk about when we talk about love, um, to quote Ray Carver. And uh, one of the we just found out we had a lot of things in common that even though we had known each other for 10 years we didn't know before such as art so i i really wanted to talk about art because both of us i think we're at a real crossroads in our education about whether or not we were going to be writers or visual artists and that's so true of so many writers i know Ask a writer to paint you something, and chances are they will be able to. So I'm interested in that, and I'm going to try to open the water. Well, I think the workshop conversation connects in nicely to that, because while I was very stubborn in writing workshops, in my like art critiques, I was willing to take all the criticism. Like If somebody told me to change something, I'd be like, yeah, you're probably right. Let me change that. Because I really, really wanted to be a good student when it came to art. Like I was very, very receptive to it. Anything my professors said, I was like, yeah, you're totally right, let me change that. But it meant that I didn't really have like a core vision. Like there, when you talk about protecting like your idea, your insight, I don't think that I had that with my visual arts. Like I think I had a very clearly defined aesthetic and I knew it looked pretty and I knew that I, you know, if somebody wanted me to draw an apple, I could make it look like an apple. But I lacked that conviction and that kind of drive to be like, no, you're wrong, I'm gonna keep doing this. That's so interesting because I feel like the thing with me and art was that whenever I was making art, I always thought I'll, I, that I would never make a great piece of art. I could read a novel and think, yes, I'm gonna do that. And I would go to a museum and look at a painting and think, I'm never, I'm never gonna make something great. I'm never gonna make something that somebody else couldn't make. I could be really good, but I could never be great. And you studied them at the same time, right? Yes, yeah. and you did too, didn't mm -hmm. you? I was studio art English double major. So when we got to town today, the first thing we did was drop off our bag and get in a taxi and go to the High Museum together. <laughs> you all are so lucky. What an extraordinary museum but I just felt like all these parts of my brain that had been asleep for a long time just lit up, lit up, lit up, looking at, at those works. And it was really fun to go with you. And we got recognized. <laughs> we got recognized by somebody who worked at the museum who called out, Anne Lindsay. <laughs> it was so great. Um, because Lindsay and I at the bookstore, we do the laydown diaries. Yay, laydown diaries. And for those of you who aren't clapping, who are like, what are the laydown diaries? Your Tuesdays are about to get a whole lot better. That's right. It's the most wholesome thing about your Tuesdays. So on Instagram, and if you're not on Instagram, you can go on YouTube and watch them. I think you can even go to the annpatchett.com. Do you have it on your website? Yeah, it just links to YouTube. Okay. Yours does too. Yeah, right, right. So I know nothing about social media. I know nothing about the internet. I don't have a cell phone. Um, and yeah. So on Tuesdays, uh, yeah, we could just talk about that. On Tuesdays, this started during the pandemic. 
when we were closed for six months. And people were fantastically supportive of Parnassus Books, and they ordered their books from us. Either we would mail them or we'd go and throw them in the trunk of your car. And yet, I was really worried about the fact that you would know that there was a new Stephen King novel, there was a new Barbara Kingsolver novel, there was a new John Grisham novel. You, the big names break through, but how do you know if there's a new Lindsay Lynch novel? How do you know about first time debut authors? Which is a real obsession of mine, owning the bookstore. And so we decided to start this thing called The Laydown Diaries. All books come out on Tuesday in the same way that all horses must leave the gate at the same time. It's, it's because of New York Times lists and things like that. They've gotta be able to track it in a fair way. And so we started this thing where every Tuesday we would hold up the books that were published on Tuesday and talk about them for a minute, regardless of whether or not we had read them. And, um, and then when we opened again, we had all these people calling the store saying, we're so glad you're open, don't stop doing the lay down diaries. And now people watch it like it's the Mary Tyler Moore show. It's, <laughs> it's hysterical. Yeah, it's fascinating. If you just scroll through Instagram, you can watch those, like, the reels, because you can see how many people watch them. You can just watch from 2020 to now. Those numbers just multiply. Yeah, and when Lindsay got a puppy, we had a thing where every week we would hold up my dog and her puppy, and we would watch her puppy getting bigger. I love those of you who are nodding. You're like, yes, <laughs> sp the Sparky and Barnabas days. I remember that. Yeah, right. It's, it really is. You want to sell books, hold a dog up next to it. Um, OK, so I, um, you know, you're my friend, and you're my little novelist daughter, and, you're, uh, and I'm really, really proud of you. And yet, um, I still am very discerning, and I have good taste. And if you hadn't written a book that I thought was amazing, I would not be promoting it, and I would not be taking you on book tour with me. Um, but I love this book. And so tell us the plot of the book, and then you're going to read, and then I'll tell you the plot of my book, and then I'll read, and then we'll talk about writing books, OK? Yeah. And this is how I know you're discerning, because you read my short stories in like 2015. And I busted you, too. I was so hard on you. That's the other thing I love about her. OK, I'm sorry. I'm totally interrupting you. But I've had so many people who work at the bookstore who want to be writers, and they ask me to read their short stories. And nobody ever comes back, <laughs> ever. I mean, usually they just quit. Um, because I'm not a good teacher, and this is what I always say. I'm not a good teacher. I, can, I can't do that thing where you say, I love the way you use the color blue. Like, I can only it's tell you. It's a compliment you, sandwich. <laughs> I can only tell you how to make it better. And uh, Lindsay would give me a story, and I would rip it to shreds, and I would give it back, and she would come back two days later with a rewrite, and I would rip it to shreds. She's so tough and so interested and only interested in being a better writer. Like, you're not interested in about your feelings, and you're not interested in praise. You're, no, but you're interested in writing the best book you can write, and that's what it takes. OK, now I want to interrupt. I kept those pages. I still have them. You're being mean. Mm -hmm, yep. Um, so my novel, which is better than my short stories. <laughs> RIP to my short stories, um, is Do Tell. It is set in golden age of Hollywood. It follows an actress, Edie O'Dare, at the start of the novel. She is a character actress. She's got three months left in her contract. It's not getting renewed. She's not a great actress. What Edie excels at is knowing other people's business. So she's also a child of the Great Depression. So when the time comes, her contract's up. She's got bills to pay. She's financially anxious. She throws her hat in the ring and becomes a gossip columnist herself. And she finds herself in the middle of a very divisive trial when an underage actress from her former studio accuses a top-billed actor of sexual assault. Edie is forced to take sides. She has to make some impossible choices with some really, really devastating effects for people who she's known in her life. And she has to sit with those choices. 
So. And now you're going to read. Yes. I'm sticking with Edie's first Hollywood trip. Okay. Um, so I'm starting in chapter two, but you're going to get to know Edie, and there's not a ton of backstory you need for this point. In 1931, I rode into a contest. It was sponsored by Miss Appleton's Hair and Beauty Care. Live like a Hollywood star for a week. I was 19. Applicants had to write an essay about what a week in Hollywood would mean to them. Naturally, I made the entire thing up. My family was poor, but not the kind of poor that the good people of Miss Appleton's Hair and Beauty Care wanted to deal with. So in my letter, I gave my parents a raise and nixed two of my five siblings. <laughs> my father became a manager at a soap factory, and my mother stayed home to care for her children. I borrowed some old issues of photo play and Screenland from one of our neighbors who was an avid collector. I searched for every advertisement for Miss Appleton's and I wrote down the names of the actresses featured in them so I could cite them as my favorite actresses in Hollywood. Finally, I sold a pair of my old shoes which were supposed to go to my younger sister to pay for a headshot. The picture would run with, run with an article announcing the winner of the contest. At every train station during the three-day trip out to Los Angeles, I saw my smiling face in the newspapers. Miss Edith O'Shaughnessy of Boston, Massachusetts wins the trip of a lifetime. Alongside an ad for Appleton's was the picture of me, grainy from being reprinted in the paper. It wasn't even clear how much care I'd taken to arrange my hair just right. The brief accompanying ad copy included all the lies I told about myself. My week spent living like a Hollywood star involved trolley tours around Paramount and MGM Studios. I was permitted to be 100 feet away from Norma Shearer while she filmed a scene on a closed lot. That was fine. What was even better was Miss Appleton's put me up in a decent hotel and let me order food to be sent to my room. It was the only time in my life I'd ever ordered one of everything. I still remember the taste, the t I still remember the taste of the ice cream sundae I ate while sprawled on my bed in a hotel ro robe and slippers. On my last day, I went to FWM Studios and had my face made up by the same woman who regularly worked on Nell Parker and Jeanette Manning. She trained my curls into a neat wave and pinned them for me. I was loaned a few dresses from the costume department and then sent over to a studio where I'd get to have my picture taken. Everyone was perfectly respectful. The man behind the camera coached me on how to tilt my head and angle my shoulders. They let me try three different dresses and a nice woman told me which jewelry looked best with each one. The dresses weren't even particularly nice, but I'll never forget how it felt when I put them on. Growing up, I had gone straight from wearing children's clothes to house dresses. There had never been a time when I dressed to feel beautiful. When I saw myself in the mirror with my face and hair made up, wearing a gown pinned along the back to showcase my every curve, I didn't feel just beautiful. I felt promising, as though I was worth so much more than my life had offered during those past 19 years. At one point during the photo shoot, I looked over at the Miss Appleton's representative charged with handling me for the week and asked her when I'd be signing my contract. <laughs> I was only joking, but she looked up from her magazine, gave me the once over and told me my chances would never be better than they were at that moment. Part of my contest winnings was a year's supply of Miss Appleton's hair and beauty care products, which I sold for three months in a lady's rent in a lady's boarding house. I never took my train ride back to Boston. When I called home to break the news, I couldn't get through to either of my parents, who were perpetually out working. My mother had been, barely been on speaking terms with me for the past year anyways, not since I helped my brother Seb leave for college. I had to leave a message with my sister Jillian. I lied and said I'd be back in a month or so. I told her to keep an eye on our sisters until I got back. Every month, I called and I lied. It went on until eventually my sisters were given instructions not to accept calls from me anymore. There you go. <laughs> you gonna tell us a little about Tom Lake now? I'm gonna, yeah, and, and actually, now that I just heard you read that, I am gonna back up and read the other part. Um, when we were out today, Lindsay said, you know, we both have scenes in our books where our characters go to Hollywood for the first time. And when I read mine, I'm going to just think, whoa, did I completely plagiarize you? I can't, <laughs> can't remember. Um, that's the basis of our friendship. <laughs> anyway, so Tom Lake is, um, is a novel that is set around the play Our Town. 
and it's about a woman named Laura who stars as Emily in Our Town when she's in high school. In college, she's Emily in Our Town again. She gets scouted, and then later on, she goes to a fictional Summerstock Theater Company in Michigan called Tom Lake. And the story has two tracks, one in which it's 1988, she's 24 years old, and she is at Tom Lake having a fabulous time and a fabulous affair with a guy named Peter Duke who goes on to become a famous movie star. In the second track, it's 2020, it's the pandemic. She and her husband live on a cherry orchard. They have three daughters in their 20s and the daughters are demanding that she tell them the story of when she was an actress and when, which at the end of her summer at Tom Lake, she was never an actress again. So yeah, uh, we both wrote books about people who thought they were going to be actresses and changed their minds. It's kind of funny. All right, so this is my take on the first time Laura goes to Hollywood and she's also 19 years old because we just wrote the same book. Um, <laughs> Go back to New Hampshire, to Bill Ripley sitting in that darkened university theater beside his sister. Ripley wasn't new to the game, and when he saw me, he understood what he was looking at. A pretty girl who wasn't so much playing a part as she was right for the part she was playing. Unlike his niece, I knew how to not ruin things. When I got off the plane to Lo in Los Angeles, a deeply tanned man in a black suit held up a clipboard with my name on it. He took the little duffel bag from my hand and walked me out to an honest to God limousine, double parked in front of the terminal. You could have knocked me over with a feather, as my grandmother liked to say. Had he driven me around the airport and dropped me off in the exact same spot and I had flown back to New Hampshire without ever seeing anything else in California, it would have been worth it because one day I would be able to tell my children that I had ridden in a limousine. I rolled down the tinted window so anyone straining to see who was in the back of that car would see it was me <laughs> basking in the sunshine. The hotel had a swimming pool. A small gift basket in my room contained fruit so foreign to me that I didn't know how to eat it. A note from Ripley read, welcome, please sign for all of your meals at the hotel, which was nice enough, but hardly the same as, welcome, pick you up for dinner at seven. The hamburger I ordered from room service was brought to me beneath a great silver dome, which the waiter whisked away with a flourish. As far as I could tell, everything in California was something out of a movie. I ate a $15 hamburger in a fluffy white bed and practiced my lines. The next morning, a different driver in a different limousine drove me to a soundstage at Warner Brothers. For two hours, people dressed me, undressed me, and dressed me again. I sat in a fancy barber's chair Exact, I sat in a fancy barber's chair while a black man wearing a pink t-shirt that fitted him so exactly I was sure it had been tailored took off the makeup I had so thoughtfully applied that morning <laughs> and then painted a whole new face on top of my face. When he wanted me to lift my chin or turn to the left, he held his finger in front of my face. Follow my finger, he said. And so I did. Wait, I just turned two pages at once. I hate it when that happens. <coughs> Eyebrows, he asked the man sitting in the chair beside mine reading a script. The man looked at me in the mirror and then he looked at the makeup artist. Hold off, he said. A woman with hair as fine and colorless as corn silk and no eyebrows at all brushed out my hair and then picked it up and poured it through her hands again and again. Look at this, she said to her colleagues. It's like a shampoo commercial. I kept thinking of that scene when Dorothy and her friends get spruced up before they're taken to meet the wizard. Pat, pat here, pat, pat there, and a couple of brand new straws 
That's how we keep you young and fair, merry old land of Oz. When their considerable efforts were complete and I had been transformed into someone who looked like my more attractive first cousin, I was taken onto a set where I stood in front of a white backdrop. The man who'd been sitting in the barber chair next to mine took my picture. His praise was so obsequious that at first I felt embarrassed for him and then I felt embarrassed for myself. Another man came in with a small camera on a tripod and asked me to say my name, Laura Kennison. He asked me to say the name of the film, Singularity. And then he asked me to say the part I was reading for, Lindsay. <laughs> when all that was done, they took me onto the set's open space where Ripley was, and everyone else was waiting for me. Um, so one of the things that I did for the secondary minor characters in this book, they're all named for somebody who works at the bookstore. So <laughs> that, was Lindsay's, that was Lindsay's appearance in the novel. <laughs> but that is kind of crazy that we wrote those two scenes. Yeah, and we also have character names. We both have Nels, we both have Sebs. I got my Nell in 2018. When did you get your Nell? Um, my life is full of Nels. So all of my characters come from people that I know for the for most part. Now, my Sebastian is only called Saint Sebastian. He is never called Seb. Yeah, my Sebastian is Seb. And is Seb, yeah. And, and I actually chose that name because I am a Catholic and I love Saint Sebastian and I love the pictures of Saint Sebastian who's tied to a tree and has arrows all run through him because that really is the story of poor Sebastian in this novel. We're not nice to our Sebastians. We're, our Sebastians have a very hard road to hoe. Did you ever act? I went to a high school that was very theater intensive, a lot of famous people. In my biology class, there was a guy who, up until a few weeks ago, was most well known for originating the role of SpongeBob. Wow. Which some of you might be making this connection now. He's now most famous for breaking up his marriage to be with Ariana Grande. Um, <laughs> SpongeBob and Ariana Grande are together? <laughs> Things you didn't expect to learn at this event. I'll tell you what, I, I thought she was shooting higher than that. <laughs> um, but anyways, that's all to say I went to a high school that specialized in theater, and I think I had like a love of Shakespeare, but like I was not prepared for the kinds of kids that I went to high school with. Um, again, SpongeBob. <laughs> so they immediately terrified me, and I did not, like they were always there, so I took in a lot of like, theater energy, but I was terrified of them and did not cross that threshold. Do the actors in your book stand in place for something else in your life? I mean, are the actors, when you were imagining them, were you sort of drawing on actors or were you drawing on some other people that you knew in your life? By the time I drafted this book, I was pretty much on like an IV drip of films made between 1935 and 1945. Um, so a lot of them do have at least on-screen counterparts, like their personal lives are fabricated, but a lot of them, because under the studio system, like actors had such specific types, like you were gonna be, a, you sign a seven-year contract, they tell you you're gonna be a cowboy, you're gonna be a cowboy for seven years. So I, I drew a lot from like those public personas and then wanted to invent the private persona. It's funny because it, it really hasn't been until I've been on tour and I've been talking about this that I realized that Peter Duke, who is who goes on, at the end of the summer, Peter Duke goes on to be the most famous actor of his generation and Laura stops acting. And what I was really drawing on without thinking about it were the guys that I went to graduate school with, were the poets. But it's very hard to write a book about a hot, sexy poet. I don't know. This, well, Did you even go to grad school? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are plenty I mean, of hot, sexy poets. Th there were, th but it's very difficult to convince a reading public of how hot and sexy those poets were. 
they had motorcycles and they smoked unfiltered cigarettes and you could always find them at the bar at one o'clock in the morning talking about Proust and they suffered terribly. <laughs> And sexily. <laughs> and I, I wanted to help them through their suffering. <laughs> I wanted to be there for them. Um, and I just, I, I mean, this is actually true. I don't think that I could write a book in which I could convince you that a poet at that age was just so devastating, like terrible behavior, but completely worth it because he was so hot. <laughs> But I could easily convince you that a crazy, self-destructive actor was so hot that he would be completely worth it. You see what I mean? Yeah, so you have to find the right guy for the job, or the right job for the guy. Yeah. Did you ever do acting? Um, I, you know, in high school, but I don't think high school counts for anything. Um, Unless you went to my high school, SpongeBob. Oh, well, oh, right, 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 right. If I could do my education over again, I would take nothing but acting classes because I just feel like acting is the most useful thing in the world. If you're writing a novel, you, you're creating characters and you're figuring out scenes and, and pacing and plot. And if your novel becomes successful, you are on stage doing public speaking which, or you're going on the Today Show, which acting would be super, super helpful. It was funny reading that scene out loud and, and thinking about the first time I was on the Today Show and calling my mother and saying, someone just painted an entirely new face on top of my face. Like there's no part of me that looks like that person, but they just spackle it on, yeah. And I feel like we've had conversations because when I'm writing, I will like read out and act out scenes. Part of this might be Hollywood novel, but you you do not, correct? I read out loud. I do read out loud. I don't act though. It's torturously hard to read a book out loud. When my grandmother was alive, I used to read all of my books out loud to my grandmother. And I remember reading The Magician's Assistant to her and the boys, I'd just gotten my first dog, and the boys would stretch out on the floor like puppies, and her hair was curled like the ears of a Springer Spaniel, and it was like, there was a dog metaphor on every single page of that book. And, and that's why I have to read out loud, because I don't hear all the dog, I don't see the dog metaphors if I read the book, but if I read it out loud, they become so embarrassing. Uh, so what do you learn from reading out loud to yourself or to your dog, Barnabas? <laughs> Barnabas has, does get to listen to me read out loud a lot. Um, I think it's, especially for this time period, because it's so voicey and it's tricky. Like, you don't want to spend 330 pages in, like, a thick transatlantic accent. That would be insufferable. So I think for me, reading out loud was modulating, like, how voicey it got at different points and making sure that like, cause Edie does have a very specific cadence of speech. She's a gossip columnist, like she's got that, you know, pacing, but making sure that you're not just like inundated with like Moira Rose for 300 pages basically. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. I don't ever think about that. I always just think about word repetition and, and where I've gotten sloppy or where I bore myself. Because if you're reading something out loud and suddenly you're like, wait. <laughs> I wrote this book. I've got to stick with it. Um, OK, so we are going to open it up for questions. And before, it, be, don't get up, don't get up, because I'm going to tell you how this is going to go. But before we start questions, I want to say what you all already know, which is a huge thank you to the Carter Center for having us here in this gorgeous, gorgeous auditorium. Um, and a huge thank you to Acapella Books. Uh, you guys are so lucky to have such a wonderful, wonderful independent bookstore. And my role on this planet is to promote independent bookstores and to promote authors and to say that if this system 
is going to work, uh, we have to support it. So, and I know you know that, but thank you. So I will just say thank you for shopping local throughout all areas of your life. Uh, you don't miss the water until the well runs dry. And if you want to have an independent bookstore, gardening store, hardware store, liquor store, whatever you still have here in Atlanta that's independent, you just need to make sure that they're OK. And again, this was something that just really hit home during the pandemic when we weren't even open and people supported us. And I was so grateful. And also, really make an effort to support young writers and branch out to names that you don't always know because Barbara Kingsolver was not Barbara Kingsolver out of the gate. You know, it's like we, and I have thought so many times on this tour, like I'm getting so much press and it's been great and I'm so grateful. But if this was Tom Lake by Lindsay Lynch, you know, it would be like Do Tell by Lindsay Lynch. Well, you plagiarized me, so. Well, yeah. there's that. I mean, it's very, it gets super confusing. Um, but you get so much credit for your career. And so you get reviewed, not for a book. It's like, oh, this is such a wonderful book. But it's like, no, it's actually, it's a wonderful career. And, and then you've got to build the career. And so we all have to take part in that. So when this is done, I want you to go out to the lobby and buy yourself a copy of Do Tell by Lindsay Lynch. All right, so the way we're gonna do questions is not to go to the microphones and line up because I do this a lot and it just isn't a good idea. Frankly, it's not a good idea to give a microphone to civilians. I am sure <laughs> that you guys are great. But on the chance you're not, <laughs> I'm going to be in charge, OK? So what we're going to do is you're going to raise your hand, and you're going to say what your question is. And you all know what a question is. There's a question mark at the end. And then I'm going to repeat it back. You know, this is so great, because when I say these things, everybody just laughs and laughs and laughs. Like, oh, she's so funny. But you know what I'm talking about, too, right? <laughs> I always say, like, Reach down inside yourself and hold that crazy part that just wants to stand up <laughs> and just talk for 10 minutes. OK, all right. It's important to let people know what your expectations are. With that said, does anybody have a question? Or are you just too scared? Yes, you do. Lindsay, what's next for you? Uh, well, I, I, the question is, Lindsay, what's next for you? Anne remembers to the, repeat the questions. Yes. She might knock over water bottles, but she remembers to repeat the questions. Um, I do continue to work full time at the bookstore. At Thank the you book very garden. much. Yes, of course. Uh, they literally won't let me leave. We will uh, And Anne has announced this publicly several times. Yes. Um, but, but we're I talking am... about giving you a sabbatical, so just be grateful. <laughs> Anne has now said on the record that I will get a sabbatical so that I can continue to research um, mid-century painters. Um, it's, that's what's next. Okay. Yes, front row. Um, I'm a writer. I write speculative fiction. My next book, though, I want to write naturalistic fiction because even though my own life is very boring, I think that there's something deep there. And this is a really important question to me. I don't know if you can answer it. I won't, I, I'll try not to cry. Um, how do you know that a book that you want to write is something that will be interesting to other people, that the characters that you want to write about I can answer this question. How do you know if the book you want to write will be interesting to other people and if the characters will have life to them? You don't. And that's, listen to me, listen to me. That's not your job. Your job is to write. That's your only job. You, you have to make the art you are never going to be in charge of how that art is received. And you, it's like, that's it. That's the whole story. You've got to just be willing to make it and to fail, because you don't have a choice 
because it is so important to you. And if you do have a choice, and it's not that important to you, then you'd do something else. And a gorgeous example of this is my friend Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote a book that she just withdrew because of what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. And she got a lot of flack about withdrawing the book, although she was completely right and she did not feel the need to defend her decision. But when we were talking about it, she said, that was the book I had to write. And I wrote that book. I'm a writer, that was my job. What happens afterwards doesn't matter. I can never control it. So you write your book. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Question for Lindsay. How did you get interested in the golden age of Hollywood and what research did you do to learn that cool stuff like how you become a seven year cowboy? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just a yeehaw lifestyle. <laughs> um, I've always been a fan of old films. I definitely grew up watching them with my parents. My sick day movie was always bringing up baby. I love bringing up baby. Um, but I've also always been fascinated by gossip and scandals, especially in the US, because we don't have like a monarchy to obsess over the way other countries do. We have celebrities and public figures, and I think gossip and the way that we talk about celebrities is so interesting and so important, because it does feel like a way to measure a society's morals. You know, when we look at celebrities, what behavior do we praise? What do we ridicule? Who do we cast out? Why? So that under the studio system is especially interesting because the studios were absolute monopolies. Like you sign that seven year contract, they control your life for seven years. They can change your name, they can change your hobbies, your backstory, they'll invent relationships for you. So I was interested in both this question of gossip and a society's morals, but also under this hyper controlled studio system where they can make any narrative they want. Yeah. Question over there, yes. I'm asking for a friend who couldn't be here tonight. You're thoughtful. He's not even here. That's because he didn't hear my speech. <laughs> Lay it on me. Okay, do you want me to just, let me just c catch up here really quickly. So it, the book has two narrative lines. Was it always going to be that way or did it change at some point while I was writing? Is that the general gist? Is there more? There, of course there's more, okay. <laughs> If, if it's not a question, we can just cut him off. If it's just talking about how he feels, I don't, I don't actually care. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, what, what? Wait, what? Okay, so he thought it would be good for two books, but he liked how I put them together. So, yeah, it was... It, <sighs> I spend a long time making up a book before I start writing it. And I work different things out all in my head. And so, you know, was this my original idea? No. By the time I started the book, was it the way it was going to go? Yes. And the trick is usually when there are two narrative, two storylines running on parallel tracks, the reader likes one better than the other. And what happens then is the reader reads at different speeds. And that's what's so interesting to me. So if you don't like one, you're gonna read that fast, and then you're gonna get to the one that you do like, and then you slow down. And so what I was trying to do was really braid the two stories, which is why the daughters constantly interrupt. 
Um, and there's a great picture book called The Interrupting Chicken, <laughs> in which this, is that Ezra Klein? Who, who write, wrote The Interrupting Chicken? Yes. Ezra Klein? Thank okay, you. As I'm not the children's buyer. Oh, well, okay. And so the chicken keeps breaking into the story, and that was the inspiration, interrupting chicken. Okay, balcony, how are you? Yes, right in front of me. I was wondering why you chose Oh, that's a great question. Why I chose Michigan for Tom Lake? Because the story is, starts in New Hampshire. Thornton Wilder wrote Our Town in New Hampshire. I originally thought it was going to be in New Hampshire. I just kept being pulled to Michigan. I have a lot of friends in northern Michigan. I've spent a lot of time there. What I always want when I'm writing is a place that I know a little bit, but not too well, but also where I have people that I can tap for knowledge. And I have a really good friend named Aaron Whiting who uh, went to Interlochen High School, which is a school of the performing arts, and she had grown up on a cherry orchard, and then after college, she founded a professional theater company. And I was like, all right, you're everything I could ever want. And I would just ask her endless questions, and I could sit up here for an hour and talk to you about how to graft fruit trees. <laughs> I really could, because it's fascinating. How is this side? Oh, right, yes, yes. Sure, so what does our town mean for me and how in 2023 could I write a book that wasn't cynical and was more about the kind of values and love that are represented in our town? It's because I'm not on social media and I'm not joking. I have never looked at Facebook. I don't have a cell phone. I don't watch television under any circumstances. I mean, None. There is a television set in our house because my husband watches Titans football, and that's it. Um, and I get my news through the newspaper or the radio, and my life is so full of good people. My life is so full of loving, kind people the people at the bookstore being the perfect example. I mean, we have each other's back. We genuinely love each other. One of the girls, was it Maddie's 21st birthday party? Mm -hmm. One of the girls who works at the store just turned 21 and she asked if she could have a slumber party in the bookstore. <laughs> and everybody came and slept in sleeping bags, but they also had reading periods at the slumber party. We made friendship bracelets. <laughs> There are horrible, horrible things going on in the world. They are very well represented. And there is also tremendous love and kindness that is sometimes less represented. So if I want to write a book about love and kindness, in which many bad things happen, I mean, this book is not a laugh a minute, uh, but yeah, so, oh, and also, what does our town mean to me? At this point in my life, and I have read it probably every year since I was 14, and I'm 59, it's, it has become a Buddhist text to me, which is this, life is comprised of small, ordinary moments. That's what life is. And if you are always looking for the bigger, more exciting moment, or the thing that is to come, you will miss the only thing you actually have, which is your life. So there you go. Plus, I just love our town. Um, now, before I take another question, I see my friends looming in the back. Is it time for us to wrap it on up? Do one more, you, because your hand is so enthusiastically raised. <laughs> You own an itty bitty bookstore? Yeah, it's like just the space in the market. 
God bless you. Where is it? In Forsyth, Georgia. In Forsyth, Georgia. What's the name of it? Dog-Eared Books. Dog-Eared Books. You guys go to Forsyth, Georgia to Dog-Ear Books. Okay. What's your question? What do you do? <laughs> Lindsay, you want to take, let's do this together. What do you do to, to help a bookstore? Have you tried social media? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just stomp all over everything Ann just said. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's exactly what I would say. I don't have social media, but the bookstore has social media, and I have benefited from it hugely. No, but I, I will fix that answer and make it better. Um, <laughs> which is that the thing that bookstores, I think people are drawn to, is that we have long-standing connections with books that we're obsessed with, and we never stop talking about them. And I think that is why our social media is so successful, is because it's just us booksellers talking about this book from 2015 that we're still thinking about. Um, and even if it's not on like as large of a platform, like I think that is when people come into Parnassus, and this hasn't been the case with every bookstore I've worked in, like they really do want to talk to us, and they genuinely respect the fact that, like it is a weird corner of retail where we happen to be obsessive and like scholarly over the things that we're selling, and I think that's what brings people into independent bookstores. Yeah, I mean, I always say we're the island of lost toys. Everybody is too terrific and smart and amazing to be working in retail, and yet, where else would we go? Uh, we just, we need that store. Build your community, have a dog, do a story time, <laughs> um, get an author to come in. Just, it's, it's sort of like the same answer to you talking about writing. It's like, if you have to do it, you'll do it. And, and if you build it, they will come. I really do believe that. Uh, but good luck to you. That is fantastic. I'm so glad you're doing it. OK, I'm going to talk to you, because I am a bookseller, about how the rest of the evening is going to go. So all the copies of Tom Lake are signed. And you need to go and buy your copy of Do Tell. And Lindsay will sign it if you want me to personalize my book I will happily personalize it. Please don't come up and tell me about the fact that you had been cast as Emily in our town <laughs> in high school and that your life has been a meaningless charade ever since. Um, tell me all about it. Because there are a lot of us here, and it clogs up the line. And um, I also will say that in respect for COVID, I am not doing pictures in which I will snuggle with you. And you're welcome to take pictures of us while we're signing or say, stop and look up, and we'll stop and look up. But we will not do that thing where we stand up and wrap our arms around you while your friend tries to figure out the photo app on your phone. Because <laughs> I've been doing that for a long, long time, but there still are viruses. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now, and now, a word from our sponsor. Did I tell you this was going to be a great evening or not? And the thing is, they allowed us to do the two things that we really like to do have a best-selling author and have an emerging author so that you can get the best of both. If you have not, I know all of you got uh, uh, Anne's book uh, to get reservations. I encourage you, especially after you've heard Lindsay, to go out, if you have not already, and get a copy of Do Tell, because you can then be the person who said, you know, I was there when her first book came out. I know that author. Let's thank Anne and Lindsay one more time. <laughs> and if you'll line up over this way, we'll sign down here in front. Okay.